Hi everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at the uniqueness theorem for Poisson's equation and we're going to derive this theorem which turns out to be a really useful result that helps us to solve certain kinds of problem in electrostatics and also in Newtonian gravity. Now I've written out uh, Poisson's equation in one particular form up at the top here and it says that del squared phi is equal to rho of r where del squared is the Laplacian operator phi is the function that we're trying to solve for, and this rho of r is just uh, some source term, it's just a function that depends on uh, position in 3D space, right? So this r is just a 3D position vector. Um, and depending on whether you're looking at a problem in electrostatics or in Newtonian gravity, you will also see uh, various physical constants multiplying uh, this rho of r on the right hand side, and you might also see a minus sign on the right hand side. Now I'm not including any of those constants or minus signs just so that we make this analysis more general, I guess. We can we can imagine that we've absorbed any constants or minus signs into this function rho of r itself. Now to understand what the uniqueness theorem actually states, I'm going to start by drawing a very simple diagram, which is basically just this, um, this ellipse shape. And this ellipse shape that I've just drawn represents a volume in 3D space, which I'm going to call V. And this is basically just the, the volume of interest um, for this particular problem. Okay, and so we're, we're interested in solving for phi within that volume V. Now I'm also going to label the surface that bounds that volume V as S. And so for a particular problem, we're going to consider two different types of boundary condition, right? So in general, boundary conditions are just some information that we're given about the behavior of uh, phi on some, uh, well, on the boundary surface, S, right? Um, we're going to consider two classes of boundary condition. Uh, so let me just write this down. Basically, on the surface S, we are going to know, we're going to be given either, so one possibility is that we could just be told, well, phi is equal to some function f of r on that surface. In other words, we could directly be told how phi behaves on the surface s. Another possibility is that we could be given the normal derivative of phi on the surface s. Okay, so, or let me just write this down mathematically. Um, the normal derivative is basically just the rate of change of phi um, along the direction which is normal to the surface s. Okay, and so that is n hat where n hat is a, a normalized vector which is perpendicular to the surface s uh, dotted with the gradient of phi that could be specified as some known function g of r right you might also see this normal derivative uh, sometimes written as d phi by dn now what the uniqueness theorem uh, states is basically that if we can find some function phi that satisfies Poisson's equation and that also satisfies the given boundary conditions for a, for a particular problem, then that function phi is unique, possibly up to an additive constant. Okay, and so for physical problems, we generally don't care about that additive constant um, for reasons that um, I'll go into towards the end of the video. So let's get on with uh, proving this theorem. And what we're going to do is suppose that we have two different functions, let's say phi1 and phi2, that are both valid solutions to our problem. Okay, so let's just write that down. Let's say we um, suppose uh, that phi1 and also uh, phi2 are solutions to our problem. Uh, in other words, what that means is that we know del squared of phi1 is equal to uh, rho of r, and we also know that del squared of phi 2 is rho of r, because they both uh, are valid solutions to our equation and our boundary conditions. Okay, what we're going to do is consider another function, which I'm going to define to be the difference of phi 1 and phi 2. So let's introduce psi, and let's let psi uh, be phi 2 minus phi 1. And let's act on psi with the Laplacian operator del squared. Okay, so yeah, if psi is phi 2 minus phi 1, then what is del squared psi? Well, because del squared is a linear operator, we can just act on phi 2 and phi 1 individually with that same operator. And so this is del squared phi 2 minus del squared phi 1. But 
we know that those two things, del squared phi two and del squared phi one, those are both rho of r, okay? And so we get rho of r minus rho of r, which is zero. In other words, we've just shown that del squared of psi is equal to zero. So this next step might look a little strange at first, but it's gonna become clear over the next few minutes why we're doing this. We are gonna consider uh, the following expression, which is the divergence of psi times the gradient of psi. Okay, and so we basically, we're going to expand this um, and get um, what is essentially a, a vector calculus identity. Um, we can kind of, we can expand this just by using the product rule. Um, so we're going to act uh, with this gradient operator first on psi and leave this grad psi unchanged. And then we're going to have a second term where we act with this, uh, this operator on uh, grad psi and leave the the psi uh, in front of that unchanged, right? And so if we do that, our first term is going to be grad psi um, dot grad psi. And then we're going to have a second term, which is psi times um, this thing here. Uh, so del dotted with the, the del operator, uh, and then that acts on psi. Okay, you can prove that a bit more formally using suffix notation. I'm not going to do that uh, now. Um, and so we can write that in a slightly simpler way as, well, this first term is just the modulus squared of grad psi, right? Because we've dotted it with itself, okay? And the second term is going to be psi times del squared psi, right? Because this thing here, del dot del, is just the Laplacian operator del squared. Now, this is useful because we showed in the previous step that del squared psi is zero. And so this term just disappears, okay? So what we've got, right, is that the divergence of, divergence of psi grad psi is equal to the mod squared of grad psi. Okay, so why is that useful? Well, we've got a divergence here. And so why don't we try integrating that over a volume and seeing if we can apply the divergence theorem. Okay, so we're gonna integrate both sides uh, over the volume V. Let's do that, integrate both sides over the volume V and apply the divergence theorem. Okay, so if we do that, um, let me first, I'm gonna write out um, this right-hand side first. So we're gonna find that the volume integral of the mod squared of grad psi um, is going to be the integral over the surface S, applying the divergence theorem to this left-hand side here. Uh, it's going to be the surface integral of, um, so a unit normal vector dotted with psi grad psi ds, okay, where ds is a little uh, surface element. Okay, so from there to there, that is just applying the divergence theorem. Um, and because this psi here is just a scalar, uh, we can take that out of this dot product and say that that's equal to the surface integral um, over S of psi times n hat dot grad psi. Okay, All right. So the reason this is useful is because we can now use uh, our knowledge of the boundary conditions here. Okay, and so what we've got here is the product of psi itself with n hat dot grad psi, which is the normal derivative of psi, right? And so let's think about what we know about those two things that are multiplied together. So on the surface S, which we're integrating over, right, we know that, um, well, let's consider that the, the case of this first type of boundary condition first, where we were given phi is some function of R. If phi is some function of R and phi one and phi two both satisfy that boundary condition, then what do we know about um, psi? Well, psi is um, phi two minus phi one, remember, but on the surface S, if they both satisfy the same boundary condition, then they both have to be equal to f of r, right? So that's just gonna be f minus f, which is zero. Okay, so if we're given this first type of boundary condition where we know phi on the surface S, then psi ends up being zero on that surface. What about the alternative case when we're given the normal derivative? Well, if we're given the normal derivative, then we can make a very similar argument. We can say that n hat dot uh, 
grad psi is going to be basically n hat dot grad phi 2 minus n hat dot grad phi 1. But if they both satisfy the same boundary conditions, those are both equal to g of r. And so we just get g minus g cancels out and gives us 0. And so in either case, regardless of which type of boundary condition we had, uh, this whole term just becomes 0. Okay, And so what we've shown is that the volume integral over the volume v um, of the mod squared of grad psi is equal to zero. Okay, so what can we learn from that? Well, what we've got here is a volume integral of a um, quantity here, uh, mod squared of grad psi. That quantity is bigger than or equal to zero, right? Because it's the mod squared of a vector. It can never be negative. And the only way we can do this volume integral and end up with zero is if the gradient of psi is equal to zero everywhere inside the volume v, right? Because if it was positive anywhere, you would never be able to cancel out that bit of positivity because it wouldn't be able, it, it never goes negative, right? Because it's, in, well, it's the mod squared of a vector. So it's, it's either zero or it's bigger than zero. So yeah, if we want to end up with zero, it has to be zero everywhere in that volume. And so we can conclude that the gradient of psi is equal to zero, uh, the zero vector in the volume v. And if a function, a scalar function like uh, psi has a gradient of zero, um, that means that psi itself is just a constant, right? Because gradient tells you how something is changing in space. And if the gradient is zero, that means it's not changing in space at all. And so it's just equal to some constant. So uh, what we can learn as our final step, remembering the definition of psi, which was phi two minus phi one, Okay, so if psi is a constant, what that means is phi 2 is equal to phi 1 plus some constant. In other words, they have to be the same up to a possible um, additive constant here. Okay, now um, let's just think again briefly about the two types of boundary condition. Okay, so if we have this first type of boundary condition where we're given uh, the behavior of uh, phi itself, okay, um, Remember that under those circumstances, we showed that psi, right, psi was zero on that boundary S, okay? And so if psi is zero on that boundary S, then psi is not just a constant everywhere, but we can say um, that psi is zero everywhere if we're given that first type of boundary condition, okay? And so in that case, if we're given that first type of boundary condition, then we can just say that um, phi two is equal to phi one everywhere. Right. If we're instead given the second type of boundary condition where we know the normal derivative, then we can't necessarily say that the constant is zero. But the good news is that it doesn't really matter because, well, in the in the physical context where this, this Poisson's equation comes up, the function phi that we're solving for is the potential, either the electrostatic potential um, or the, the gravitational potential. And those quantities themselves don't really have any physical significance other than that when you take the gradient of them, you get the electric field or the gravitational field. And so the point is that ultimately what matters in physical contexts is um, the grade is not, is not phi itself, but it's the gradient of phi. Okay. And so if you take the gradient of both sides of this, because the gradient of a constant is zero, the gradient of phi two would be equal to the gradient of phi one. In other words, the um, you know the electric field um, for a given problem or the gravitational field for a given problem is a unique solution. Okay, and so we can we can use this uh, uniqueness theorem. Um, it's, it's, it's the basis of what we call the method of images, which is quite a powerful way um, of solving certain certain problems. And uh, I'll be saying some more about that in some of my future videos.